Today we sit down for a second time with Barry Marais and we had such a great conversation that we've decided to make this a regular feature on this podcast. For those of you who are fortunate enough to see Barry's first episode, you'll know that Barry has built a successful career in and around radio. He is a voiceover artist, does editing on audiobooks and even helps manage other voiceover artists. He's working for Prime Media through their Cape Talk station and has some fascinating insights and experience in life. In the show, we touch on some pretty serious topics and we have a couple of good laughs. Our topics range from mental health and well-being to homelessness, developing self-belief and surviving trauma. Enjoy today's episode. Welcome to Coffee and Conversations with Champions. Start recording because, you know, all of this stuff is pretty much gold as it is. And um, I'm just waiting for that background to move to something quite cool. Yeah, that looks quite cool. All right, good. So, uh, no, you know, it's all practice. And you can just, you just say to the person, thank you for, thank you for helping me evolve, huh? So, well, true that, right? Yeah, true. true. I, I, I see you. I see you have your vape. Do you uh, have your coffee? My vape. Oh, Not I saw chance. smoke. I smoke cigarettes inside no, this <laughs> office of mine. I know. And I, I have saw. my coffee. <laughs> I saw. Uh, let me close that and close this. Sorry, <laughs> but I did see the smoke. So I was like, "Hey, I need to tease Barry about vaping." I've gone. I've gone from <laughs> conventional cigarettes over to rolling my own. Oh, cool. Um, and okay. Is a good deterrent and makes me smoke a lot less because it's a lot more effort. Yes, but probably better for you in the long run, right? I think so. Much less yeah. like chemicals. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. I, I, but look, I mean, better for you, right? Yes. Well, it, it's, you know, like a, I like with the, the vape argument where guys are like, no, it's better than smoking. Yeah, I, I suppose pancreatic cancer is worse than skin cancer, you know, that kind of, that kind of stuff. So literally, literally. yeah, exactly. Um, I remember, you know, for my late mom, um, who, you know, she was, and I mean this seriously, she was well ahead of her time um, in terms, I'm just adjusting my volume here so I don't deafen myself. Um, she was well ahead of her time uh, in many things, but also in her dope smoking. <laughs> so, you know, the thing for, with her was, I mean, I was rolling, I was rolling her joints in a Rizla machine, probably from the age of about six or seven. Um, you know, with the with the, the the cooking pot, with the metal sieve, and uh, running it through the sieve to break it down, get out all the seeds and the little twigs and stuff. And and I got very very proud of my ability to roll that I could pack it so tight that you didn't need to add tobacco. So, needless to say, I was very popular. <laughs> the Europeans, they like to mix, and I found out why, and it's also because they, they pay a lot more for their product. And mm. so, mixing tobacco does make it go a little further, right? It stretches it a bit. Right. When you speak to locals here where, I mean, it grows so abundantly, it's very affordable, they'll tell you you don't mix. Mm. And the re reason behind it is we don't mix good and bad, tobacco being the bad. I know a lot of people who have had problems with alcohol, problems with drug abuse. Yep. And for them, the pot conversation is a taboo one because they do very much camp it in all together, right? And it's yep. part of the very same mirage of things that is no longer okay in their mm -hmm. lives, which I totally understand and respect. Well, you know, so here's like, this is my background on this. One, I saw my mother use and in reality abuse dope. I saw her use and abuse prescription medication. You know, there's a whole other argument where you want to talk about drugs. So I saw that challenge for me. I mean, I'm an alcoholic. So, you know, this is my, this is the top of a beer bottle that was melted. And I found it and bought it at the biscuit mill when it first opened in Cape Town. And uh, I wear this just as my little reminder that for me, every day is day one of sobriety. So being so, you know, for me, drugs, any type of drug, any type of medication, um, you know, any opioids, anything like that, effectively bar panado, um, 
is is a no go because it's not something that I'm willing to risk uh, in terms of my nature and my personality. And being fortunate enough to have worked in rehab centres for sixteen years, fifteen sixteen years. Um, well, I mean, having been in recovery for for sixteen years, let's say that. Rather, I've seen the damage that marijuana can do, that dope can do, uh, mm-hmm. where the person, and I'm not a fan of the term addictive personality. You know, many people say, oh, I don't have an addictive personality, so I'm fine. I, it's not about addictive personality. What I've, what I've seen over the years is trauma, unresolved trauma, and any tool that we pick up can become a problem, right? So for someone who can use marijuana or use alcohol or use prescription medication without it affecting the quality of their life, without it affecting the quality of the lives of people around them, Barry, you know, good luck. The problem with that is when we open the door to that, we don't know what the long-term consequences of that are going to be. So... You know, may, maybe it's almost around the lines of we need a, a, a responsible drinking council that you have to sub or, or a smoking council that you have to submit a report to every year, and you go in for an interview. <laughs> Can you? Imagine? No, and I you get know? that. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and I really, I really mm. do. Um, uh, you know, it's it's what you're saying is completely valid. Mm-hmm. And and a hundred percent, and I know, and I you know, I can absolutely attest to that. You know, the dependence, in in my opinion, because mm-hmm. excuse the sounds, right? It, it will stop now. Don't worry. You're because you're a hard work. Technical. Hold on a second. We discussed this in the first podcast. You're a hard working man with many hats, so no, no problem. It, eventually, they stop. Yeah. Um, no, it's it's as you say. I, do, I also don't necessarily subscribe to the idea of having an addictive personality or not an mm. addictive personality. I think it, everything comes down to the relationship you have with something. Mm-hmm. Caffeine is another one of those things that uh, come with oh. the added value of being completely addictive. Yeah. So you know. Uh, but however, the, the, the problem with marijuana, and yes. it's almost it's a bit of propaganda that, that has circulated. It's not propaganda, it's true. The problem mm. is it's not physically addictive. Scientifically, it is not physically addictive. There's nothing in no. your body that is going to crave the marijuana when you stop smoking it. It's the emotional side of it, which yeah. makes it almost not harder. But that emotional and mental dependence is a dependence like any other. Mm. So... Definitely, you know, it, it's it's definitely, as you say, it, it is a, a thing that can be considered a drug, a thing that people do abuse when abused too much. However, my argument for it and the reason I'm sort of for it, not sort of, the reason mm-hmm. I am for it is simply because of the wonderful positive benefits it's had in my life. Yeah. With it, in, when applying responsible use. And, mm-hmm. and I say that not that I've always applied responsible use. I think it's always gone in phases. But in times where I have, you know, in, in times where I've used it responsibly, it's been great for me. It's been great for my ADD. It's been great mm-hmm. for my ADHD. It's just served as a ben- more of a benefit than it has a downfall yeah. up until this point. And I know that there is a massive division with regards to that opinion. That's mine. though. But the, the thing is, what is so valuable is that we're having the conversation, right? You know, it's not being you you can't vilify something um and then you can't i mean something on this level you can't say well can't talk about it not prepared to discuss it because that closes off the conversation of okay how what is responsible usage what are the risks what are the challenges um you know i think as as a pain medication uh as a pain control medication sure I think far healthier than any form of, or, or many forms of, uh, so I'm just chuckling because we're both drinking our coffee here, talking about drugs. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know? this is by far the drug I use the most, I must admit. Eh? So, so the number one drug in the world, you know, <clears throat> and uh, I suppose it's interesting because <clears throat> marijuana, hang on a second, sorry, give me a sec. So listen, talk about, do you see my Is coffee that a cup? Nescafe jar? It's a Nescafe jar. I'll tell you about that now. 
Listen, there, I used to, while you sipping, there's a guy that used to gym at the same gym I gymmed yep. in in Pretoria. And he would, because it was funny, I suppose, he had an empty Jack Daniels bottle as his gym water bottle. Bottle, yeah. So that, <laughs> you know, these, talk about caffeine. Uh, the the Nescafe jars, I was going through, and rem- like I have to watch what I do very carefully all the time as an alcoholic. I was going through one of those every three days. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I ended up with like two tablespoons per cup. And what I realized is it wasn't the, the caffeine, like that, stu- that stuff's designed to give you a high and then a crash. So you have your next cup. That's what my personal experience is that I found with, with Nescafe. So I just switched to proper bean to cup and my, my usage came down tremendously. But it, I mean, that's a huge, huge drug. And <laughs> it's probably the most used drug um, I think it is the, the most world. used drug in the world, yeah. But yeah. you know, talk. I think for me, so the number one thing that we need to do in terms of keeping ourselves safe is being honest with ourselves. So the uh, one of the the things that I've seen with marijuana usage, um, and I suppose to a degree, and with alcohol usage, is if we start to isolate and use the drug on its own without anyone else around us. So, you know, I think getting together with a group of people and smoking or, you know, Holland going to a cafe and whatever that is, when there's a social aspect of it, and then you come up with these wonderful ideas, you write them down and you read them the next day and none of them make any sense, (laughs) which I've done. the the thing is when we start to isolate and i've seen that even barry with myself um during covid and uh even in recent times we're having built the new studio when i'm spending a lot more time on my own than with other people that's where the risk comes in drinking on your own smoking on your own all of these things where your behavior changes and the the drug allows you to um, increase that change of behavior. So whether it's running podcasts or working or smoking or drinking, we've got to manage, we've got to watch our behavior. We need to be honest with ourselves about that. I I can't agree more. Mm. I can't agree more. You're very right. I think it's um, a very human thing Mm. to um, want to tell ourselves, you know, I'm in control. I'm fine. Um, if you know, it's a, 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 a I'm, I'm yeah. stressed out, so I'm drinking more coffee or smoking more pot or whatever it might be. And as you say, one must be critical in that way of, of what mm. we intake. And I think food is another thing that's, uh, and I feel that as well, but my diet's terrible my, and my partners as well. We, we live together and inevitably eat together yeah. and we work from home as well. And what happens mm. then is you sort of, I, I can't, I don't know how to say it. The act of cooking has become like a, a special occasion on Sunday, mm. I'll cook something lecker, you know, and the rest of the week, it's, you know, you're snacking and you're doing all the rest. And that is, you know, that's just as mm. bad. I think you're, you're, you're not giving your body a fighting chance throughout the week to perform and be optimal. Um, and then you're throwing on top of that 20 cigarettes, a bunch of caffeine, mm. maybe some pot, maybe you're mm. a person who has a drink every other day, and you're mm. not eating well. Um, if you're like me, maybe you're doing all of that and then only sleeping X amount of hours as well. Um, yeah, it's not sustainable. Luckily, it's not sustainable, right? Our bodies tell us. Yeah, well, that's I mean, our bodies are far smarter than we are. So, you know, if you can have a yardstick um, to measure that. So I, mean, I love I love my cigars, but sometimes I haven't smoked frequently since the mid 90s. And um I started again, but it would be, let's say, once a guy every two to three months, and it would be with good friends. And it would be a commitment of time, which is what I really value about it more than anything. I've gone and hung out with the guys when they're smoking. And, you know, it's that for me is good. Now, I think that is better for your soul. But uh, I, I bumped into a friend of mine, Warren Joubert, who is a, a former SA. Uh, boxing champion and he said to me hey nick those cigars dude you better stop them they're going to mess with your cardio so maybe something that we can do which is a point that you touched on you know if we can set a baseline for 
exercise for training for you know maybe you can do a mojo market to cafe neo and back in 35 minutes and then suddenly with your lifestyle on a sunday you know it's now taking you an hour you can start to question so we need those we need definitive things to manage ourselves right and mm. to test ourselves against rather than just our opinion but the sunday is kind of cool I mean, t tell us about the Sunday. What's the, the plan? No, there? I mean, Sunday tends to be the only day of the week that I mm. work less. I don't not work. Mm. Um, as of yet, there's not yet a day that I don't work, um, which is not healthy. It's something I'm trying to change. It won't change anytime soon, unfortunately, for the foreseeable future. Mm. But I try to take Sundays and embrace doing nothing and cooking good food Um is kind of part of that for me you know it's my heart it's it's a bit like a bit of a hobby it's my way to put it we put some music on we cook like mm. a feast and and that's a way of relaxation sure. but that's i mean that's absolutely fantastic i think there's something very primal or very fundamental to the human condition around food right that you know absolutely. It, and i think probably one of the greatest ways to express love or affection is cooking and we learn that because you know we got love going to our grandparents because grandma makes something that fantastic or our mom or a special occasion and cooking and sitting down with someone you're the you're the you're the the, the focus and the attention right and that's a commitment of time which is wonderful i i mean any you know whenever you if you go to someone's house or you visit with someone there is no as you say it's such a display of love to cook for somebody Yes, um, and, and to have dinner with people is such a great way of connecting as well. Mm. Food brings people together, together, you know, and, and, and various cultures together, etc. So, uh, uh, to mm. not to pivot completely, mm. but like, how have you been? How was that pivot? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll both do it. Yeah, how you been? <laughs> exactly. No, listen, dude, I've been great. Uh, thank you. It's been, um, you know, it, and it comes down to just managing what I'm capable of. So. There's a lot of podcast work to edit. Um, I made time today after our podcast that I'm going to do the editing because the podcast recording is the easy stuff. So I could literally just take it and drop it in. But I always want to give it a little bit of a preempter, a preamble. And then there's got to be some text. And I'll go to tell you, I love ChatGPT for that because it's every dyslexic dream. Like you dump, you, you, you kind of brain vomit. And then you give it a context and, and it cleans it up for you, which is awesome. Um, I just wanted to touch on the on the hard working point where you, you know, where you say you're trying to work less. A couple of years ago, um, and I was still married at the time, I went and I chatted to a good friend of mine. He's the he's the CEO of a multinational listed company. He's a very powerful, very successful guy. But an, an incredible human, really down to earth, loves his sport, runs a whole bunch of charities that nobody even knows about. And I said to him, you know, I'm working from four in the morning and I'm getting home 10 at night, 9.30 at night, 8.30 at night, all of these different things. And, you know, is it fair on the family? And he, he said to me, you know, I said, like, should I cut back on these hours? He said, you're doing what you have to do. You know, we have to work hard and you can you can build a life. And if you want to provide a good quality of life, you've got to put in the hours. So I don't think it, it's such a thing where we're going, oh, I'm working to that eight to five is really non-existent anymore. And I think if you look at any single parent, right, they're working three jobs, you know, many are working three jobs or both you know, multiple couples. Are so it's not something that we should ever berate ourselves for, but we just need to make sure it's not adversely affecting our health. So sure. look, know, I, and I can yeah. agree with that. I'll, I'll tell you why I, why I say this is I, mm. I was, I have a mother with an, with a, an amazing work ethic. I've mm. never seen anyone work. My mom is 62 now and still does 16 hour days. Listen, and I'm I 50, think, I'm, I'm, hold on a second. I'm 52. 62 is very young. Oh, well, it's not old. I don't mean think yeah, it's old yeah. at all. And especially if you meet mm. my mom, doesn't give you the impression of an old mm. person. What I mean is, after forty years, she's still pulling hours that yeah. that a lot of people would never manage. 
and she loves it. My mom's a pianist and a piano mm. teacher and a lecturer. So she loves the work that she does. However, the hours are immense. Yeah. And the reason I say I want to work less is simply mm. because, oh, sorry. So, so to interrupt myself, I mm. too have inherited this work ethic. I'm very grateful mm. for that. I am not afraid of hard work at all, at all. But I find myself often, of late especially, mm. people ask, how are you doing? I'll be like, I'm so busy. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. And I don't think it's a complaint as much as it's a, I don't know, like a lot of the time I find myself struggling to keep up a little bit. And then I realize it's just time to take a step back because what I'm very guilty of is mm. sometimes overloading the fork and then dropping the ball. More than once I've done that, right? Where I just say yes to too many things and inevitably somewhere you drop the ball and you tarnish mm -hmm. your reputation in doing that. Mm. Um, you know, you're keeping eight people happy, but that ninth person who's just as important, now you've missed a deadline, you've, you've cost their project, uh, you know, additional mm -hmm. budgets or whatever it might be. And, and that's just kind of not acceptable. And I'm dealing with it now. I gave up a gig last week. Mm -hmm. So, so, so I don't know if I told you about like my Wednesdays last mm -hmm. time we spoke. Not. So like my Wednesdays, I, 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 I wake up at, at quarter past two and then I'm at the station by 3 a.m. And mm -hmm. I work until 6 a.m. there, come sure. home. And then I hustle my hustle until about 12, one o'clock, read news, do all of my gigs. And then at two o'clock, we start preparing for the next day's show which I'll then do until about 5 p.m., 6 p.m. And then on yes. Wednesdays, I'll get in my car after that 16-hour day and drive to Greenpoint and go host a quiz night until 10 p.m. and then come home and then sleep from 11 p.m. until 2 a.m. and then get up and do it again. And sure. you can't, you can't. You absolutely cannot work 20 hours on three hours sleep. If, you, yeah. if anyone was wondering, I can verify. It's not humanly possible, not for long anyway. You can yeah. do it once or twice or three times, mm. but it cannot be your lifestyle. And that is where I was at last week. I was doing more than one 20 hour day per week and you lose your mind a little bit. Yeah, hundred percent. It just, I mean, physiologically, as you said, it's not possible. Then, then you, you come, I think the single, the single most important thing that we can do for ourselves is to prioritize our sleep, good quality yeah. sleep, then it's hydration, you know, then it will, the, the sleep stress management pretty much go quite closely hand in hand. I think your stress level tells you about the, your quality of sleep tells you about your stress level and then yeah. your hydration. So absolutely. And I think one of the things that I've been looking at now, I've realized, and I mean, I realized a while ago, but I keep re-realizing it is, you know, I was in Hong Kong for 10 days. And that was a great trip, but it was hard hours. But it was interesting because it was physical work. There wasn't a lot of brain engagement. There was brain engagement for a single task. It was either refereeing or it was spotting and loading. When I came back, then I produced a whole bunch of amazing content, um, a lot of shorts for YouTube. You know, I think YouTube is trying to kill us with workload because, you know, first it was put out a big, long video. That was, okay, easy enough. Now you got to go and edit that video. <laughs> sure, thank God for AI. But what I realized is like, and now for the two, three weeks, there's been minimal editing. There hasn't been a lot of chasing of podcasts and getting stuff done. And I was like, oh, okay, that's the fatigue setting in. So I think other than yeah. just the sleep, we need intermittent breaks, you know, and we need five a week off, 10 days off, two weeks off, time to unwind, rest, reset, come back, be optimal. I know, you know, Tim Ferriss spoke about it in his book where I think he was, he was every three months, he was taking a month off. And I think that's really, you know, maybe whatever works for you. So maybe it's a week off every three weeks. Maybe it's, so I, we do need those breaks in order to stay optimal because I mean, that's the dream, right? You want to make all nine of those clients really happy. You want to be Absolutely. able to work the hours. You want to be able to not waste time and you want to be able to build something special so 100 percent. i don't know your, your view on that and you know the other consequence of of, of overdoing it is mm. is you actually lose productivity you see so you work 20 hours yeah. and you realize that you could be doing a lot more in less time if you felt better if you felt yeah. more recharged if your focus was better mm. um, and that's frustrating and, and it really just it can suck the life out of you and, and yeah. you know, I love my job. We spoke about last time how I, I only work for passion, man. Mm. But you'll even end up hating that when you push it too far. Yeah. Um, 
and and again of you know even recently i was like what am i even doing do i even want to do this do i even like this and of course i love it so much i'll never not do it but yeah it can it can definitely it can get too much the the as a freelancer when i started mm. especially you know you panic because you're technically you're technically you're unemployed mm. and you just want to be a self-employed individual and that will instill in you the inability to say no because you yeah. know that you don't necessarily know when you're going to get the next client or project so if something's come your way take it with both hands mm. whereas and if you hustle you'll be hit with the fortunate dilemma where there's just too much my phone doesn't stop ringing and each project is more exciting than the next mm, project mm. and i just want them all and every hour that i can potentially sell for a value i want to sell that hour and and but you need to find balance as you say you need to you can't you can't do it all mm. um but it's sad still for me you know i i, I hated saying goodbye to quiz nights i love doing quiz nights it was the coolest part of my week Mm, um, mm. But it just kept me out the house too late, and so it, you, you know, you can't do it that way. I, I overslept this morning, by the way. I overslept for my show this morning right. because I worked until I was at the station last night until nine thirty, and sure. I got got home at ten o'clock. Sleep four hours. You just can't do it. No, absolutely not. And I think it it comes down to you know, finding the stuff that you love doing. And I don't want to give you, uh, so because it's good for us, but then it mustn't also be punishment. Because uh, I think what happens is maybe our where we we're annoyed at the work, it's more being annoyed at ourselves, right? Absolutely. And, you know, and the work just happens to be the vehicle that we can use. Maybe what, what you need to do is, now I don't want to give you this idea because I know you'll probably implement is find a um, a coffee and muffin quiz morning and uh, no. <laughs> Actually, so you can run I contacted the company I work for I was like can't you find me a quiz on a Saturday like yeah, just yeah. not a weeknight <laughs> like I'd love to keep the hours but let's put those hours on a different day that's already less booked up right and I, I completely agree with that um mm. so so question for you is I, mm. I mean because you do a lot of different things yeah and I think this is a thing that plagues potentially a lot of people that and it's again, it's a happy accident. It's a happy plague. Mm. And that is that I currently do, and you too, I know, four or five different things that might kind of be related, but a lot of them mm. are completely unrelated. Yep. The problem for me is there is about 15 more things I still want to do in yep. this lifetime. Um, in completely different industries and mm. in different walks of life. And that's when I sit and go, well, I mean, you just can't be tired. Your list is too long. How can you be tired already? Yeah. Well, I think we, uh, it isn't, um, I mean, I read a wonderful quote. It was a meme, but it was a wonderful quote. So I didn't realize being an adult me meant being exhausted your whole life or being exhausted and going next week, things will change. Exactly. And they never do. They never do. So, yeah, yeah, I think it's. It's quite easy for me. What I do is I, I write down my goals, like my big long term goals, um, you know, with the, and I look at sort of where I am and then what am I doing to to get there? So for me and all of my goals are things that I want to do that I believe will add value to my life and value to the world. So there's like there's so many different things that I want to do because I just want to chase sober experiences. So with the, with the gym, it was about always, it was a dream and I wanted to open the gym. I mean, I sold insurance for 15 years. I loved selling insurance. Um, I've got an interview. Really? 100%. I don't know. If I'll, Fantastic. Yeah. The, I've got an interview with my former MD, Glenn Norkia, who's now running the operation in Canada. Um, they've expanded internationally. The, the group was called Hereford. Um, the CEO is based down in Cape Town. And um, I moved down there, I think, in 2009 with him to open the offices. And it was then I realized that I, I wanted a change out of that industry. Insurance is the most incredible thing. And it, it drives me mad when people call themselves financial advisors. And, uh, you know, I love stirring the pot with this. Because what I tell people is this, you call yourself an advisor, advisors should be fee based, right? 
You charge for advice. You don't earn commission for advice. Insu uh, salespeople earn commission on the sale of a product. It's very and, true. You know, but the, the the thing that drives me mad is I called myself and I'm an in, I was an insurance salesman. And for me, that was a badge of honor because I could go in and very few guarantees in this world, do my job and I could guarantee that things would happen if certain things happened. So if the breadwinner died and there was sufficient life cover in place and a, a, you know maybe a trust structure after that, that the kids wouldn't have to go out of their private school, as an example, and they wouldn't have to move and they wouldn't have to go to a school that wasn't perhaps on the same level and wasn't off, you know, the same. For, so there wouldn't be dire changes in life. So that was something that I loved doing. That was something I was very proud of from partnership agreements to um, group uh, cover pension provident funds. All of these things. I love doing that. And I love calling myself a salesman because I was not an advisor. You know, I sold a product that I believed in and I got commission on it. And I, can you imagine a, an estate agent um, calling themselves a property advisor, you know, <laughs> or or a car salesman calling themselves, you know, a transportation advisor? Yeah, we got to be yeah. proud of what we do. So, yeah. But, you know, I get to, I'm going to chat to to Glenn and on this show and about the culture that they've built. And, you know, that that was something that I love doing. Then I got out of that and got into the gym. Then what I found is my passions evolve from my passions. I mean, I'm going to potentially, I mean, we, we've been given the go ahead. I'm going to Algeria to live stream the African powerlifting championships. And then potentially I'm going to another Middle Eastern country after that to run a workshop. And then maybe to Europe to meet a mate at one of the Grand Prix. You know, like these are the, the crazy things that evolve. So you can do lots of things, but if you build them as you had around your passion, it's a great way to do it. You know, fine. I, I think there's different schools of thought on this and I'd like your input. You know, do you work your passion or do you work what you're good at? And I think if you work your passion, you can become good at it. As That's so to, amazing yeah. that you should say that because I read a quote one day. Now, if you asked me this last year, I would have said you only work for passion. It's the only yeah. motivation. However, mm -hmm. in the meantime, I read a quote that said on LinkedIn, no less. And it said, passion doesn't pay the bills. Skills do. Correct. 100%. And, and there's value to that. Um, I think a, a healthy mix between the mm. two is, it, look, the nice thing is normally, not mm. always, but oftentimes when you are passionate about something, you end up becoming quite good at it because you're willing to put the time yeah. and the effort into it. So your passion can definitely become your skill. Um, I think, so, so for instance, with like, I can only use my own example. My mm. passion lies with radio. I happen mm. to have a skill in audio production, so I can edit audio. Mm -hmm. It's not my it's not my favorite thing to do, and like especially audiobooks. Audiobooks take like sixty hours to edit, and it's the most tedious process you've ever been through in your life. Really, um, and, yeah. and I love it. And, and then I sit again, and I sit two o'clock in the morning editing stuff that's past deadline, and I think, why am I doing this? Why did I take this on? <laughs> I hate it, but it's because I know how to do it, and they mm -hmm. needed someone to do it, and I know how to do it, and I want their money. So I mean, it's yeah. as simple as that. Yeah. So I think. A healthy balance between the two if you can sell your skill mm. and it happens to lie within a field that relates to mm. your passion which again and in that example it does right so i happen to love audiobooks as much mm. as i don't love making them so much i just it's all part of the the same realm yeah but i also think very few people do like uh, different careers that are completely vastly unrelated in mm. a lifetime, especially successfully. I know Arnold Schwarzenegger happens to be a really good example. He's a man who, and I know nothing about him. I just happen to know that he's had four or five really, really illustrious careers mm -hmm. in their own rights. Like Mr. Universe is one thing. Being mm. an actor is an entirely different thing. Being successful in the political sphere is a complete other thing. Uh, you know, those things yeah. are so unrelated from one another, but he's clearly got a knack for each and every one of them. And he's applied his skills 
Um, and, then, and then he put them together because he introduced the the exercise and nutrition programs for schools. So you were on the president council, and and you know, so absolutely. But yeah, you, know, you said this um, the last time we chatted, where you hate the term side hustle. You know, these are different projects. So if what you do for a living, uh, fee or for an income feeds what? How about this one? If what you do for an income feeds what you do for a living, then, you know, the two are complementary. So the Absolutely. one can work off the other. So, you know, for a living, you do the um, the the quiz nights because it feeds your soul. That's your living to be alive. And for an income, you do the, the podcast audio books. And it's kind of cool because you can then sit there and go, sure, okay, yeah, it's stressful. It's two in the morning. I'm behind deadline, but this is paying the bill, so I get to do this. Oh, yeah. You know? And then I also, you know, put in that moment, how I remain motivated is to frequently imagine what I could have been doing alternatively or what I was doing two years ago, mm. which was sitting. I was, I was a programs manager at a community radio station two years ago, and the absolute... The thing, the nail on the head, right? You know who Ikasa is, of course, our big regulatory authority, Ikasa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, every radio station has to provide Ikasa with strenuous reporting mm. on every minute of broadcasting that you do. How much news, how much this, how sure. it's admin, it's Excel spreadsheets mm. and mm. Excel spreadsheets. And I, and again, within my field of passion, it's radio, but literally comparable with what an accountant would do. I was staring mm. at spreadsheets mm. for hours and hours on end. And then whenever I sit and I'm editing an audio book and I'm feeling miserable, I think just a, it could have been a spreadsheet. It could have been a spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. That's it. And I think it, it's such a valid point and such an important point <clears throat> because what you're doing today is not necessarily what you're going to be doing in a year's time, right? And what you're Most doing right now. Not. Yeah, what you're doing right now that you may not love does not mean you're locked into this for eternity. It might mm -hmm. feel like it, but it doesn't mean... And then, you know, I suppose th there are always skills that flow from things because, you know, perhaps when you realize, geez, I do need to bring on a few other people and your um, representation of voiceover artists is now going to grow exponentially. That Now you're going to have to run an accounting spreadsheet. You know, and, and you've got the skills on that just as a small thing for managing your businesses. So, you know, sure. there are no bad skills that can't be adapted and uh, and converted, right? 100%. 100%. Question, did you, uh, are you alone in Emmett Gyms and in the other ventures that you do? Is it is it just um, you? I haven't checked the cupboard, but I'd hope so. <laughs> um, really? but uh, so you did it, I mean, you do it all yourself? Yeah, okay. So very simple, within the gym, I have an amazing coach, uh, Kanyas, who we call his nick. We call Cap. That was his nickname from Standard Eight. See, so I see Standard because I'm old. What would you call that? You youngsters, Grade Ten. Grade uh, ten. ten. So he was captain of the rugby team. Cap is running the gym. So pre-COVID, I had five coaches that I was developing through our development academy, and that was the idea. So the idea was threefold empower them with knowledge and experience that they could either run their own gym, they could work within another gym, or they could continue with us. And it worked really, you know, I took a, I took a leaf out of the Beatles page when they were, you talk about hours, right? What were they doing? 14, 18, 20 hours a day when they were in Germany. And when they came back, they had like 30 years equivalent um, of playing experience together. It's so like I had my guys at schools where they were doing 60 kids an hour teaching powerlifting for four hours a day. So they're upskilled very, very quickly. And unfortunately with COVID, uh, well, with COVID, the, the concept proved itself because Cap stayed with me. Three of the other coaches went to go and work in a physical gym. Because there was a gym that well, may not have been open at the time uh, officially, but kind of was. And then when it was official, they, they went in there. So so that worked. So right now it's myself in uh, in the gym. Oh, sorry, with Cap. So I work, he works. He does 90% of the coaching in the gym. 
And what's great is I think a lot of the clients even prefer training with him and uh, because he's younger, he's more relatable to many of them, uh, particularly with the corporates. Everything else I do. The live streaming, I have um, a wonderful young guy who's helping out, Spoo, and uh, he's working as an electrician for his dad. He's training, but when he can, he comes on board, and when we have competitions and stuff, he will uh, come for 10 days or the week and run the live stream, and we'll, we'll share that duty. And also what I've done is, because he's such an amazing personality and such an amazing, relatable young man, that he's also working in our cells. So where we have our workshops that we do, what I'm doing primarily is moving the gym towards workshops because just think it's, it's one, we get to travel, which is great for the soul, and uh, breaking that routine. And um, then also within that, um, there's a commission-based earn- opportunity for him. And uh, Spoo is Cap's cousin. So Spoo and Cap are now both in sales together because, um, so I've taken my insurance experience with that, right? And I've trained them up and I've, I've done a, you know, over a decade's worth of um, sales training when I was in insurance and then I've been invited, you know, to go and coaching other groups and stuff. So I'm using that on my own guys. So I love having two. A sales team should always be a minimum of two. So you have a little bit of healthy competition which is a lot of fun with the guys. So, but, it, yeah, but the video work, the editing, the it's all me. But that being said, um, the reason for that and the reason I do this is I realized a long time ago when I was drinking, I would work for eight hours a day and then I would go to the Keg and Beagle for eight hours a day. So maybe I would arrive at uh, six in the evening and I'd leave at two in the morning, you know, get home, pass out, wake up, make coffee and start again. So I figured if I've got 16 hours a day to work and drink, I can work for 16 hours a day. And the more occupied my mind is, the better my mental state and the healthier my mental state. So, yeah, I can only imagine. So I can only imagine. So, yeah, I, 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 I you know, one can really drive that point home that mm. that overworking is um it's not really a thing you know there's 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 an improper way to do it like we just mm. illustrated and spoke about you know when you yeah. you can't do it for sure but, you know a 12 hour work day is just a work day you know if you exactly. can be proactive and productive for 16 hours good mm-hmm. on you no You've done and, something and, yeah that day. that's it and if you so here's the thing right so i'm i'm not married i i'm, I'm divorced i don't have kids so I don't have that to fill my time. So there's certain aspects with the Development Academy where I get to nurture and, and, and with my coaches, and I get to nurture, mentor and guide. So I'm fulfilling that need within myself and hopefully getting a very good result from that. And I can see that with the guys that have come through it. So for me, it's all fun. Like I've not worked a day since I, you know, since I started insurance. Um, so in 30 odd years, uh, 30 plus years of working, I haven't worked a day. And, you know, it's about, I think if you're having fun. So for me, rather than going and playing golf or going and socializing, I have different things that I do. So we have the music label where we put out, um, you know, uh, copyright free content. We have the gym, we have the development academy, we have the media division, we, where we're doing this now, we have the podcasts within that, and we have all of these different things and different levels uh, that we do, and each one is different. How I cope with it, how I deal with it, is I'm very fanatical now, and again, uh, from stuff I picked up in the four-hour work week, is I batch. So I don't do an hour of editing and then training a client and then an hour of this and then 15 minutes of that and then emailing and then 10 minutes of sales. What I try and do is I've booked off in my diary six hours for the rest of the day and I'm going to do six hours of video editing because with my ADHD, I can lock in. I love what I do and then get those videos out and edited and uploaded. Like, 
I don't care about algorithms, to, to be honest, that, oh, you should post every day. No, that's not going to work for me. I'm, <laughs> I'm dumping it all on the platforms and then people can watch it as they do. So, you know, those are, by the way, I'm not sure if you can hear the banging downstairs. Uh, we have a wonderful, uh, I'm sure it's a woodpecker um, bird that I, I have ducks. My late dad had a lot of ducks. Uh, from Hong Kong, and it's, it, it sits on the burglar bars and it's banging on the window. And then I was trying to talk to the ducks. It comes in every day and does that. So, you know, the thing I find by like, for initially I learned to batch one day at a time. So I had seven tasks I could, comp or six tasks I could complete in a week. And that became a challenge with the coaching. Uh, but then I brought on um, extra coaches. Now I can batch two half day. So six hours and six hours. Um, right. So after three o'clock, I'm going to take a break, maybe go get a bite. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to do some sales and marketing stuff for the next couple of hours. So that's going to be fun. When you quit drinking mm. and you decided you're going to be clean and sober instead, what did that look like? Was there a, because how I imagine it looking like, I've never actually, I've never mm. asked anyone this about their experience. I imagine for that sort of lifestyle to stop, things crumble a little, and uh, then we must rebuild. Mm. Or was that not the case? Like, no, I, I, so, yeah. I, like what I mean is, I imagine you didn't go, well, I'm done drinking now. And then you went mm. on the next day doing everything except drinking normally. I imagine yeah. it being, of course, it's difficult, mm. but I wonder yeah. what it looks like. Sure. So I think that way, what you've just said, like, okay, I'm not going to, I'm going to stop drinking. I don't think there is anything more terrifying in the world. Truly, absolutely terrifying. And I say that because you've got nothing to fill that time and that void with. And then being sober for a couple of days, those demons are going to come tear at you. The, when I say demons, I'm talking about the thoughts and the feelings that made us start drinking and then made us continue drinking when we knew we should have stopped, right? So for me, I went, I, I stopped drinking on my own three times and it never lasted. Um, you know, I stopped drinking for a relationship with an amazing young woman and because she didn't like me drinking as soon as that relationship ended as, and I mean, it was goodbye, get in my car, drive to the pub. Like it was that. Okay. So it can tell you how much I really wanted to drink. Um, but what I did was I got my uh, MD, Glenn Nokia, and my CEO, Mike Dundalakis at Hereford called me into a meeting and they said, hey, buddy, do you have a problem? And I said, uh, I knew Why? right then. What, what led them to ask you that question? Uh, let me see if I can find what I pop lovingly refer to as my fat pick. Uh, <laughs> You know, dude, I, w I was, oh man, Barry, I was uh, 120 plus kilos, 50 kilos heavier than I am now. And, 50? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't know. Can you see that? Oh, wow. That's unrecognizable. You know, so that, that was me. And uh, this was pre-fat app, right? And uh, so, you know, that was, yeah, so that that's who I was. You, I, I, could, I wouldn't recognize you. Yeah. Because I had more hair, or no, I'm just kidding. no, for both of those reasons, yeah, yeah. also the bald suits you, yeah, yeah, thank you. No, absolutely, like, look, I'm, I was meant to be bald. Um, the, the thing, oh, my shattered nerve, sorry, I've just lost my oh, there we go, it's back. I'm, I'm having dongle issues, so I'm lo I lose my main monitor. So, I mean, I stank, uh, I came in every day to work and I literally stank of beer. I was falling apart. I was bloated. They could see because I'd been there for 10 years and they saw the, the collapse and they, they called me in and they said, look, do you want, uh, do you have a drinking problem? And I knew then if I said no, I would have been fired. And in all likelihood, I would have been dead within six months. I would have shot myself uh, because the drinking had stopped working. I would have killed myself in a car accident or I would have drunk myself to death. And so all of this, these 16 plus years that I've had, um, I think mean, 21st of October is going to be 17 years. 
Um, all of this has been extra time. So everything over those six months has been a wonderful bit of extra time. And they said to me, okay, so I said, yes. They said, do I want help? I said, yes. You know, it's not often, Barry, when we, we pr hit profound, profound crossroads in our lives. Like I saw a fork left and right. Death or, you know, something else. And by the way, I didn't know what being sober meant. And that's also the issue with just stopping on your own. So that I said, yes, please, I want help. And um, they said, okay. Uh, that was on a Thursday. I went to go see Dan Wolf, um, who runs House and House. Uh, this was before he and Alex Hamlin joined together to, to run Houghton. He had an outpatient uh, place called First Step. And I sat with him for an hour. We had a chat. And at the end of that hour, he said, Nick, you're an alcoholic. You start the program on Monday. And that for me was the most wonderful thing. Uh, because I thought, okay, I don't know what's ahead of me. I don't know what to expect, but these guys know better than me. I'm going to shut up and do whatever the hell they tell me. Like, uh, and apparently that's called surrender. And I went out, um, that Saturday night, I got hammered at the keg, <laughs> woke up the next day. I had a bri at my house, uh, for my mates at the keg. And I said goodbye to them. And, uh, I had three beers. Uh, for, to this day, nothing against Hansa. Um, my last three beers were Hansa's and <laughs> I had three because I didn't want to go into my first day of sobriety, my first meeting with a hangover. Had three beers, put my third beer down on the coffee table and I said, I'm done. That's it. And, you know, never drank again. But what made it easier, what, what made it easy actually, was going to a place every night instead of going to the keg because I did an outpatient. So it was four hours, um, it was from four o'clock until seven o'clock every evening. And I went and I did the 12 weeks and then I did relapse prevention and then I did aftercare and I did that for two or three years. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I think no, it was three years and then I moved to Cape Town. And uh, the first thing I did before I, I committed to going to Cape Town with Hereford was I got hold of a friend of mine, John, who, <laughs> that poor oak, he came in two weeks after I was in treatment, stinking of alcohol, broken, <laughs> and uh, looking like death. And he's built up this most wonderful life in Cape Town. So yeah, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of him as well. And he was the guy I phoned to say, what meetings have you got? So I booked my meeting. And that was what I committed to. Then I felt safe to say, okay, I'll go to Cape Town. Because I had someone that I knew in the program. I had a meeting that I could make my home group. And, and that's what I did. So when you stop on your own, you stop alone, right? And that's terrifying. That's, you become a dry drunk. You don't ever unpack the reason as to why you started. Uh, that was why you couldn't stop. Drunk? A dry drunk, yeah. A dry drunk is, uh, is someone who stops drinking and then just doesn't do the work. Th those are the old miserable grumpy men that we see in our lives that used to drink. <laughs> you know, I think you become an old grumpy miserable old fart. And with all due respect to any dry drunk listening to this, but does a dry drunk know that they're a dry drunk? No. No, they just, they, I think they figure that's just part of their nature, right? So I think there's three levels on this. There is a, there's a drunk, which is what I called myself when I was drinking. Then there is a dry drunk, someone who stops drinking, but doesn't do the work to unpack why they couldn't stop, doesn't join the program, doesn't do the step work, doesn't do service, doesn't do any of these wonderful gifts that we can give ourselves in recovery. And then there's the alcoholic. That's the person for me who joins the program, stops drinking, does all the work, does everything that's necessary, follows the five pillars, does his service, does his volunteer work. And that's how you really build a quality life. As with anything, I'm mm. sure there's like harder and easier days. Can you tell me what days are harder and what makes them harder? Um, so it's an interesting thing. Let, let me say this. There are no hard days. There are days 
where you will learn more about yourself and there are days where you will learn less about yourself. Saying that a day is hard is a choice. So I rather reframe my language because I find that works better for me. So perhaps a day was more challenging. I had to learn more about myself. The, these things test, you know, I don't even want to say tested me because I made the decision I will not ever drink again in my life and I will do that one day at a time. So there are days, you know, dude, like when I lost my grandfather, who I love dearly, I was drinking. Straight from the funeral to his place, I poured myself a whiskey. So in the Jewish faith, we have prayers. You say memorial prayers and you run the afternoon and evening service at um, the house of mourning. And I was already two drinks down for that. With my dad, my dad, was, when my dad was sick, he was in hospital from the 1st of December to the 3rd of January when he passed in ICU. And leading up to that, he wasn't well for a couple of days. Um, I actually came back from the Africa Champs to, to look after him. And I was sober and I was present and I could do for my dad what he needed, right? Uh, we had to change doctors. We had to do certain things. So being, if I was drinking, none of that would have happened. And my father, I think, would have had a far worse experience in hospital. So I was present. I was present when he passed and I was sober. So I, I would far rather have my dad here, who was my best friend, and to hang out. But none of those days were harder than any day I had when I was drinking. Because what made it hard when I was drinking is I had no control. I had no direction. I had no understanding. I had no control. It was incredibly painful when my father passed away. My heart was broken. My heart still broken. He was my best friend. and But it is not a hard day because I can manage it. I can understand it. And I can grow from it. So it comes down to how much is the day going to teach you about yourself yeah i think that's that's very powerful and i, I as you say your language just your language you surrounded can change mm -hmm. how you view it and how you feel about it and i think it's not something that one can understand unless you've gone through it yourself mm -hmm. you know yeah, I think there are other alcoholics who can listen to what you say and go yeah exactly that you know but i think someone who's never been through that cannot can't relate or understand how difficult it is and it is difficult as you say you probably wouldn't call it difficult it's not difficult mm. it's um it's um it's it's obviously just what's better right it's mm -hmm. just what's better. yeah well, what's better for us I mean, how about this it's more of what we deserve because we're well, not yeah. bad people you know it comes down to we, we're not bad people this is what we actually deserve this is how we should actually be living our lives. I think like a huge part of, and, 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 you know, not only in your context, because of course, mm. every person's situation looks different. People drink for different reasons. People do drugs for different mm. reasons. And within our broader society, I actually heard our mayor say it the other day, which was so interesting. We, we were talking about the homelessness issue in Cape Town and how do we address this homelessness mm. issue? And people were talking very practically. They were like, well, put them there or put them there mm. or move them here. And the mayor said, okay, but why are they there? You know, what's the socioeconomic reason that they're ending up where they're ending up? Can't mm. we address that? And then you're cracking open a whole other can of worms, right? Then you're really trying to save the world when you're trying to remove the reason as to why people fall out of their, you know, fall, you know, lose their way. Mm. Um, or, and, and I think that's, you know, when we can find the answer to that, <laughs> we will have saved the world. You know, I think it's, I don't think it's possible to save the world. I think it's possible to assist in helping a life save itself. So facilitating, empowering, encouraging, educating one person. You know, if we think about this, you, you want to say, you want to change the world, get everybody to help assist one person. That's it, you know, yeah. and, and it's that simple. And there is no greater value add to our own lives 
than helping another without the expectation of anything back. But I think, you know, so we were chatting about dreams and goals. And I've spoken about this as my dream. You know, like I love Gary Vaynerchuk. You know, he talks about buying the New York Knicks. Like that's his goal. My goal is there are 25,000 schools in South Africa. Um, I think 12,000 are functioning. So if we can put powerlifting, the sport that we do, the squat, the bench, and the deadlift into every school and put in three, four, five coaches to coach that, we can use that sport because I've seen it for myself to help people develop self-worth, self-belief, self-reliance, the, the understanding of delayed gratification, the understanding of having to work towards something. All of these wonderful lessons that that sport can empower us to do. And I know that it does because even with the podcasts where I've been chatting to athletes from all over the world, that's what they've been saying. You know, and here's the thing. For some of our corporates and some of the youth groups, we, call, we run our for self workshop. So it's self-defense. But the ultimate self-defense is self-belief, self-esteem, self-worth, self-love. Because when you value yourself, you are willing to protect yourself. The challenge that I think why we have so many homeless people, why we have so many broken people, there are two components. There are men legitimate, serious mental health issues that people have, like bipolar, like schizophrenia, these issues. And then there are people that are broken because of the experiences that they've had. So from child abuse to trauma to... You know, I want to talk quite frankly now, and this is quite a challenging thing, particularly about the Cape, because for me, that's where the abuse took place. It took place in the Cape Flats. Um, and having confronted and, well, confronted and having had conversations with people who were abusers, but themselves abused, it, I, I'm not in any way justifying abuse at all. But what I think as a society, we need an understanding where you have a family sharing a bed and the, the mother with her three kids or four kids and the boyfriend and, the, you know, or a different guy. And then, the, uh, uh, you know, all that has to happen is the guy comes home inebriated and wants some to be intimate with the mother once some, you know, a very callous word would be some action. The mom says no because she's not interested and he decides to take, to do it anyway. And the kids are witnessing this firsthand. So they learn no means no. Or maybe she says no, puts up a fight and then he the, there's abuse for one of the, the children. One of the kids get abused while the other kids are in the bed. And this is the reality of what we're seeing in these uh, these areas where people are living in poverty, where people are forced to all live together, where there's alcohol, where there's a, a history of uh, of alcoholism or you know abuse of alcohol because it was brought on by the society through the DOP system and these other things. We need to develop a sense. We, it's not an excusable or a justification for any of those actions, but we do need to develop a sensitivity to it, to understanding that people's morals are different to mine because they had different experiences. Now, I believe myself that we have fundamental morals that are built into us. But when you experience trauma like that at such a level repeatedly, it will skew you. It, it gives yeah, you a completely it completely skews your view and it destroys your belief in your own value and your own worth when you don't when you don't believe something has any value you don't look after it when you believe it does then you do so i think our job as a society going forward is to make sure that we can and that we do focus on empowering people's self-belief and self-worth and self-love because when you believe you're valuable you're going to look after yourself you know and, and by the way i love the point that you just made <clears throat> and it's i've never heard a story like that and it's shocking to know that there are people who live this reality 
what I was going to say on the point that you made just before that, mm -hmm. I think a lot of the human brain is a pattern thing, right? And it, can, can I say in... one quick yeah. thing? I'm just going to um, close the door and shout because patience has arrived. So I need to go, patience, I'm doing a podcast. <laughs> Give Perfect. Me one second. Perfect. Okay, hang on. Patience. Patience. How's it, patience? I'm just recording a podcast. I'll be with you. I'll be with you in a second. All right, cool. Uh, sorry, dude. So you're going to edit that out, right? Because I also decided to take this opportunity to take a couple of drags on my. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Okay, so I have a few more drags. I'm running for a P. Maybe we'll edit oh, it, it out. Maybe love we'll it. keep it in. All right, hold on a second. Let's go refill this. <laughs> Back in a second. Don't go anywhere. Well, I might as well actually also just quickly. and we're back live <laughs> no no when you're ready don't rush no no i also just wanted to go so my shame my mm. girlfriend slept in and i because i knew i was doing this oh the, the stupid story is my refuse removal comes mm. at an inconvenient time and two weeks in a row my bin hasn't been taken out yes so this morning i got a bin disposal guy to come to my house and anyway she just had to logistify all of that Okay, cool. No problem. It happens. So you were saying? I can remember my point. Mm. Mm. Yes. Here's my point. Mm. In situations, not only in situations of poverty and abuse and those very mm. extreme situations, which are, mm -hmm. which are, which is one thing, then you get privileged people like me and like you um, and like many others who, who go through a different trauma and different troubles and what i found so powerful mm. at one stage but there are different things i never i never understood why people do things like fasting or meditation even uh, but a lot of different things that people do and i never understood it until i exercised funny enough i, I went to gym for one stage in my life i went for mm -hmm. about six months and i went very loyally for six months got pretty jacked as well did up like five kgs and it is indescribable to you. One cannot explain to someone how different you feel. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're, when you're in a space, it's very hard to imagine that I can actually feel different. In fact, I can have a whole new outlook on life in a month from today. But yeah. when you say that to someone who's busy going through the most, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine not feeling depressed or feeling this way or feeling that way. But when one undertakes something like that, like exercise or meditation or mm -hmm. fasting, you're forcing your brain into a new space, into a mm -hmm. new rhythm. And that can be so powerful. And that is why I think I, I can completely understand why something like powerlifting in schools mm -hmm. can change everything. Because as you say, not only are you teaching that child something about self empowerment and self love, but the, the chemical change that yeah. happens inside of you is profound when yeah. you do exercise, diet, all of these things. And uh, yeah, I think working out could change the world. You're right. And if any, and if everyone in the world and if every person with problems mm. just chose to be selfish enough to put themselves first long enough to exercise, just get, do yeah. it, go every day, go lift something. Go get those endorphins pumping, get the blood pumping, and you will be a new person 
in no time. I felt That's like a new person before I even saw results. In fact, I yeah. saw no results for a really long time. I'm a skinny guy, right? My affliction has never been weight loss, but picking up weights is the challenge. Yeah. And long before I saw physical results, I felt mm. the mental and uh, Aspect, change yeah. occurring. You, you know, it, it's time commitment to yourself. It's time commitment to your self-worth. And it can be something as simple as taking two 500 mil Coca-Cola bottles, filling them with water, holding one in each hand and going for a walk around the block. And maybe yeah. every lamppost you get to, you do five overhead presses. Or five. Yeah. So it's so easy to do. And that's, you know, the thing is uh, what we need to learn. And, it, like you know, it's interesting. The Russians don't have a word for the phrase working out. So what the Russians refer to it as and, and what I've taken on myself is we need to practice strength. Because strength is a skill. And people think I'm not strong mentally physically spiritually but like physical strength at any of those others mental and and spiritual can be developed and physical strength is a great way to develop them so you need to go you keep a program you write down what you're doing and again you know journaling is such a powerful thing because what i try to encourage people to do is to journal to write down everything that they've been through to write down everything that they've survived so that they have it in writing how strong they are how powerful anyone they who are. doesn't walk around with one of yep. these get yourself one of these okay hang on one second <laughs> <laughs> hold on you need it so um yeah talking about your journal <clears throat> i just wanted to share mine because Mind prettier, it sparkles. Oh, wow. <laughs> you need one of these. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And with a big pen, doesn't have to be anything fancy. You know, that's no. it. All, always with you, always with you. And that's it because when we, I, I think there's something profound, and it's not something within typing, not, but the actions from the hand to the yep. the brain to the hand to the page. It's a wonderful way to get to understand who we are and we need to write down what we've survived so that yes. we can go back and say geez you know what i survived that i have what it takes to survive this but a quick side note mm. on that yes because i and i, I because i've chatted to people about the, the benefit of journaling mm. and i should mention this is not this yeah okay they're very different yeah a journal is not a diary 100 um, percent. a journal is a journal Mm. And, and I think that's important to, to have both, right? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I can't agree more with you on, on, on that. It's, it's, mm. it's, it's actually almost annoying how much we have to do to be okay as human beings, but we got to do these things. We need so, to journal, yeah. we need to exercise, we need yeah. to eat right. Yeah, but you know what the cool thing is? How commit, so like, let me speak as, a, as an alcoholic. How committed was I to drinking? You know, nothing would stop me drinking. That's what I love. I love telling addicts that our addiction is truly, truly our superpower. No, it's our superpower because nothing would stop us. I would lie. I would cheat. I would steal. I would manipulate. I would charm. I would con. And by the way, that was just what I was doing to myself to enable myself to drink, you know, not even to others. Um, you know, and... <laughs> It's so if we're willing and able to do all of that, now that we have a little bit more control over our lives and where we want to go, the journaling is not so hard. The the exercising is not so hard because you know what? No one wakes up with a hangover after journaling. No one crashes that. Well, hopefully no one crashes their car because of exercise. Maybe, you know, after a really hectic leg day. <laughs> You can't, yeah. hit the, you can't hit the brakes. <laughs> you know? But like I'm saying, like the consequences of journaling, the consequences of exercise, the consequences of eating right, the consequences of getting enough sleep, of drinking, are far less dire to our existence and our quality of life than the consequences of the other things that we ran to so willingly. I mean, how many people do you know can't wait to get to the pub after work for a couple of drinks 
you know, oh, sure. and to be social sure. and to, but, but there are also those who can't wait to get to gym, you know, well, they yes. go to gym in the morning. So these are the things, you know, it, it's about understanding that all of these things mean we have a choice. And now that you say that, and I don't know how much time we have left, mm, but if it's yeah. my final point, yeah, the last, if, it, if it's the last yeah. thing I get to say on this podcast, what well, I would no, say no, 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 because again, you're back in two weeks. Remember, this oh, is, we'd love to. We're, we're, we're doing this honest. as I love this. We're doing this as a regular thing. It, yeah. it, you know, mm. I actually lost my train of thought. Let me get it back mm. quick. Let me get it back okay. quick. It was important because it was complicated. Now my brain threw it out. Oh, yes. You know, I was, uh, again, I always talk about how fortunate I was with the parents I have, because I really mm. was. I, I was I was born into a family that was just, my parents were also a little bit older when they had me. Uh, my mom was 36 when she mm. had me, which looking back now, I think the fact that she was a mature adult by the time she had me, mm. I grew up yeah. with such stability, you know, mm. such stability. And I was also a child who was told throughout my life, you do what you want to do, do it well, and do it with passion. Mm. But you can do anything you want to do. And I don't think we tell people that enough. Because I talk to so many people on a daily who do what they feel they have to do, unaware of the fact that you are literally free to make a new choice any mm -hmm. second of the day. And if you put those into literal terms, you can get up from your desk mm -hmm. and walk out and never come back and no one can actually do anything about that. You can yeah. actually do that whenever you want to. You're free to do whatever you want to, whenever you want to. And yeah, it's a shame if you waste that opportunity. It's uh, absolutely. But the thing is that if we unpack it deep, deep down inside, do you believe that you are worth making that change for? You know, that's the thing. Do yeah. you believe and that you have the value? Uh, because, the skill. oh man, I've seen such beautiful, beautiful, beautiful kids uh, in rehab put themselves in such horrendous situations, you know, for drugs, for alcohol, um, selling themselves, selling their souls. And we sell ourselves when we don't believe. Sorry, think about that. Okay, maybe we sell ourselves. But what we sell ourselves for determines what we value ourselves on, right? Yeah. And again, I'm not at all saying that someone who is in that situation and does certain things is bad or it's inappropriate. You know, my drinking, I did the best I can. I, I did the best I could with what I had and with where I was and with what I knew. Um, and it only changed for me when I realized there, there was another way. So until we realize that. But we have to have that self-worth, right? We have to fight. And until we do, we need to hand that self-worth over to someone else, dude. So yeah. it's such a valid yeah. point that you've made. Very and life will surprise yeah. you when you start asking for stuff. And I don't mean yeah. asking for stuff. I mean working mm. for it. But like yeah. life will surprise you when you go out there and you go for something and you'll be so shocked mm -hmm. when it kind of just works out in your favor. Yeah. I like to tell people like my story of working at Prime Media. When I got to Cape Town, because I come from community radio, mm -hmm. like I had plenty of reasons why I could not work for a station as big as Cape Talk or KFM, because I'm not a qualified individual. I mm -hmm. literally barely have matric. I mean, barely. Mm -hmm. I'm a varsity dropout. And so and could, I could go on to give you the reasons why I don't belong in that building. And out of, out of, probably a little bit of arrogance. I just applied anyway. And out of all the community stations I applied for, I applied with six community stations in Cape mm. Town. Do you know who phoned me back? Cape Talk phoned me back. There you go. Yeah. And I shocked, shock and horror. I cried leaving the interview. I sat in Prime Media's office. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've been to Prime Media's office here, but it's a carnival, right? The so, theme so of their office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, oh, not the new one. I was there at the original one in 1996. I don't Maybe. know if it's still the same one. I come no, no. It. it was a beautiful view of um, Table Mountain from behind. And then they stuck up a big billboard on that with their numbers in the sales office. But yeah, okay. So Carnival, excellent. Beautiful office. Yeah. Looks like a Carnival. I yeah. went for this interview. 
and the people in this building and like wackheads there and all the radio presenters that I grew up listening to. And excuse me, my excuse brain, me, excuse me, Mr. Simpson. <laughs> yeah. My brain blew up. And I left there with the weirdest mix of emotions mm. because I still had this very loud voice. Actually, the, the emotion I left with was complete despair because I left thinking sure. these people aren't going to phone me back. Why would they phone me back? Like they mm. gave me the interview, but why on earth would they phone me back? I've just gone into the office and told them that I'm unqualified to be here. So I left feeling broken about it. And I was like, just look at that place. I'd give what to work for this place. But I already convinced myself I wouldn't be able to work there. And so it just life just let me life just let me. And I think when people go out, put yourself out there and you go try things and you phone people up and it's like, Hey, I want to do this thing. Mm. Are you qualified? No, but I learn fast. Yeah, that's it. You know, it, it, it's such a valid point. Because the firstly, you 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 don't get what you don't ask for okay and just because you don't get it the first you know you don't get what you ask for the first time doesn't mean you got to stop asking you know and and that again i think is proof of self-worth and self-love on a very profound deep level that we may not even realize that what the hell let's just go for it and see what happens you know that's a just fire out question like i learned selling insurance like, I, I just want to share this with you. <laughs> yeah. And I know we can go on for hours. And hours. I, this is why I booked another call for 1030. Uh, but <laughs> okay, it's with my ex wife about curtains, but it's a different <laughs> story. <laughs> Give her the curtains. Yeah, there, there's a plug. No, she's making curtains for me. She's the most amazing oh, dressmaker. Ex wife ever. No, no, no. She, she's an amazing dressmaker. She's an amazing designer. And she very kindly, like we, we chat, she's making me amazing curtains and she's made like this, this beautiful, these beautiful, heavy velvet curtains. I don't have the echo in the studio and now I'm putting them downstairs, but uh, that's another, there's a plug for Comet. Um, the, um, I now completely forgot where I was going. Help me out here. Ex-wife uh, curtains. Okay. Yeah, before the ex-wife and the curtains. Um, oh, uh, selling insurance. Oh yeah. Selling insurance. So the thing is that like what insurance taught me, where you talking about going into prime media and asking, right? Insurance taught me to ask. And over the 15 years I was in insurance, it taught me to ask in such an amazing way that no one could say no. So asking is also a skill. And we develop that skill by asking more and a lot. You got to practice. If you can bench press 50 kilos and you want to bench press 150, it's got to take practice and commitment. So that's the thing. And I think all of your asking and sending out CVs to the uh, community stations and uh, going from one level to the next, that's what got you into um, asking Prime Media and all of the talking and stuff that you've done in the radio industry has, what I mean, talking to people and the different facets of it got is what got you into prime media we got to ask we got to be you know willing and now i i almost feel sorry for <laughs> i feel sorry for the schools that we're going to be dealing with for our workshops because they don't really have an option in saying no because i'm going to train up our sales guys that they will be so good that there are no no's you know, yeah. and, and that's yeah. it. It's a skill. And that's really what we got to we got to practice. And dude, I I can tell you, right, I'm my dealings with you when we were speaking about getting onto the show, how polite you were, how respectful you were, how truly grateful you, you came across and that you were like that. I sure I'll come on at uh, 430 in the morning. Uh, yeah. Was it 430 or 330? 430 like, in the morning. 430 in the morning. And, um, you know, and like, you're very good at what you do. So I just wanted to say that. Well, you know? I do appreciate that. That slot's been the bane of my existence. I start with an apology every time. When I ask people to do that slot, I'm like, hey, we have this feature and I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but it's at 430. Yep. You know, it's a, a thing that I have a, a very dear friend of mine, Michelle Blumenau, who is a publicist and she's a publicist for companies in the te financial tech space right so she's dealing with all of these high-end uh, firms and she she said to me like 4 30 in the morning that is so awesome because do you know what that would cost you to talk about yourself like it, I, I 
How can anyone moan? If there's a three o'clock slot for four minutes, I'll take it because it's, you know, well, look, that's we the don't, value. You know, we don't play this card because it's, mm. it would be arrogant to do so. But yes, it, you know, when we speak amongst ourselves, certainly because we get no's, we get no's from yeah. companies who could really benefit from the airtime. And yeah, if you have to pay for that airtime with yeah. our company, it's a you lot. know, you know, dude, and, and Africa was like, well, tell us about yourself and tell us about you. I'm like, what? Oh, geez, I came on to talk about like, thank you. You know, like, re thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for helping a small South African company talk about themselves to such a wide platform. I mean, like, how can you say no to that opportunity? You know, it's an interesting thing just on the side. I'll never forget the original CEO of Hereford, Patrick Magna, got invited to speak on SABC. And it was at five o'clock in the afternoon or six o'clock. Like had to go fight traffic and this. And I just watched him that he was so excited. He canceled meetings. He did. It. And this is a guy that built up this massive business. And he was as happy as a, you know, like as a kid who had the first opportunity ever to talk at a family function about what he does. Like he was grateful to be there for the exposure. Not, are you mad? Can we do another time? Can we pre-record it? It's like, yeah, like no arrogance and just gratitude for that opportunity. I mean, how can people say no? Oh, I get so many, I get so many no's. I get so, uh -huh. and, 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 and you know, often we get this, and I'll say it here as well, because I really do feel that way. We get this very arrogant, who's even listening at that time? And the answer is plenty of people, especially healthy people that get up early to go and work out yep. and to go and, you know, the, we have a massive audience at that time. And um, they're alive yeah. and well, you yeah. know. Do you know that the first half an hour of our show is an open line? Yeah, and at 10 sure. past four in the morning, our phone starts ringing. And those people yeah. are not phoning us to ask how we are. They're phoning us because they're ready to debate politics at yeah. 10 past four in the, <laughs> morning, in the morning. They're ready to go. Yep, 100%. And by the way, ju just as, as a side note, everything's recorded. And you can take that clip from the podcast and implant yeah. it on your website to say, yeah. oh, I spoke on 702 or Cape Talk about this. And so the smart it, ones do. Yeah. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's crazy. Like what an amazing gift you guys are giving people. The fact that you're going, sure, you know, we could actually be running another series of ads right now. And well, or, no, you yeah. know what, the other side of that coin, mm -hmm. and that's why it's such a beautiful complimentary thing that happens mm -hmm. there. It's yes. I acknowledge the wonderful opportunity that it is for the businesses. Mm. But on the other side of that scale, here's this small business owner who mm. needs to go work his full day, now getting up two hours earlier than he would have so that he can give us a scratch of content for our mm. listeners to enjoy. And so it really is a, it's a give, give day yeah. because we, you know, as much as we are, you know, it's lovely for us to give that advertising mm. with nothing there. We've got nothing. We need, yeah. we need that. So That's it's amazing. lovely in that way. That's awesome. But uh, yeah, you and I both know that all business, you know, guys who work for themselves are up already at that time. So <laughs> yeah. Listen, the latest thing that's got me, I got it, and, and this you can edit out now. Yeah, I'm just yeah, talking. Yeah, yeah. I, the other day, because I, I just moved into the house. So yeah. the landlord sent a guy to come and look at my garage door's motor at 10 in right. the morning, which is a very okay. decent time. Yes. So this guy phones, he's at the gate, and I'm door saying, hey, I'm sleeping hard. And I walk out here with my gown on and I open the door and, and like he commented something. Yeah. And I look at him I'm like, listen, man, I get up at two. Okay. And I like, yeah. completely, <laughs> I got so impatient with this man. Yeah. But if I come back home and sleep. That's what yeah. I do lately. Like when I've got the time, oh, mm. I grab it with both hands. I 100%. get here and I climb the right nap. back into that bed. I feel terrible for it, but I do it. No, you, you got to do it. You, you know, proof of self-love. You know, it, that's what I love about the body. As, as you said earlier, you know, the body will show you what you're not doing yeah, yeah. The body right talks. for it. Your body will talk and it's smarter than we are. All right. Dude, I think we, we're going we're gonna to end it there. Wonderful. Uh, I'm going to end the recording and then I'll just chat to you quickly as well. All right. Awesome. Dude, thank, thank, you. thank you again. Thanks for having Mary. you. Yeah, I think we, we need to come up. You know, coffee and conversations with champions is great. Um, I love multi-segmenting things. Um, you know, like I'm the guy who walks into what's it, Plastic World and sees all those filing doors and goes like, oh. <laughs> I would spend my whole, I would spend everything I have in Plastic World. 
Absolutely. All right, I'll be back in a second. But we'll we'll come up with a name for this. All right. 